Uh, looking. Welcome back to the Manage to Win podcast. I'm your host, David Russell. Today's episode is sponsored by Dave's Charm School. Got a lot of things happening over there at Dave's Charm School. You ought to check it out. New courses, animated episodes that are short to the point, great talking points for you to discuss with your people to learn new skills, new habits. Got to go for it. Today's episode is a lot of fun. It's with Stephen Cardinale. He wrote a book called Synoptic Alchemy. And it is a powerful book on how you can know yourself better, know your business better, and then destroy something, build something to replace it, and then scale it. So destroy, create, and scale. Great tips here. Let's dive in. Welcome, Stephen, to the show. You have written the book Synoptic Alchemy, and you've also got a great business background. So where do you want to start? Well, thanks. I'm really excited. Uh, excited to talk to you. Excited to talk to your listeners. Um, so Synoptic Alchemy actually came out of me running a company called SID Management that I started, oh, geez, probably 14 years ago now and sold it about uh, four or five years ago. We started, me and my partner, we both put up, well, individually, we put up 2,500 bucks, so a total of 2,500 bucks. We grew up from me and my partner uh, to about 700 employees when we were done and walked out with a $45 million uh, M&A exit. So I've been through the uh, founding and the pain that that involves, <laughs> the growing a company, how do you hire people, how do you you know, grow fast enough, and then the exit in the M&A process, which is a whole beast all in of itself. <laughs> um, so it, it was, it was an, an, an amazing ride. So, you know, I do have the background. I've got a, a, a Wharton MBA and I'm an econ guy from UCLA. So I've got an academic background, which is, gives me a lot of the underpinnings, but the reality is what you're going to hear about is the, on the ground, this guy did it from scratch all the way to successful exit and the learnings that came from that, which, you know, are really helpful. Yeah. I mean, how did you choose this name? I don't even know. I know whether I know the real meaning of either word. <laughs> you know, <laughs> synaptic alchemy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so it's interesting. So SID management, the company that I ran and started, you know, um, that was successful it is a healthcare company. It was a healthcare technology company. So it's in a very regulated space and most everything we did came from the synapses in my head. It's, it's really interesting. So I'm a tech guy, right? I'm not a healthcare guy. Um, and I know you, you were, you're, you've been in tech for a long time. I've been in tech, um, even though my, you know, my uh, academic background is uh, economics. It's so interesting to be able to go from your head to your fingers onto a computer and stuff happens. I talk about instantiating, pulling stuff from the heavens and instantiating it on the ground. And that's the synaptic part. I believe that all value, and if we look at, let's say, you know, Amazon or Intel or anything comes from between our ears. And what we're really doing is we're taking low value inputs, lead, which is the alchemy part, and turning it into gold. So if you look at the subtitle of the book, it's the art and science of turning ideas into gold. And that's what we did at SID Management. So um, most of what we did was we wrote software for, it's the most boring thing ever, but the most boring thing ever <laughs> makes money. <laughs> the super sexy stuff once in a while hits it out of the park, but boring stuff makes money. We wrote, wrote software for the healthcare industry and for insurance companies. And that's, that's where the alchemy started. And there's three steps to this alchemical process that I learned that really allowed me to um, grow the company. So I'll give you a clear example. We used to have uh, doctors and nurses uh, would use our software to make better medical decisions. And one of the things that you know, I thought about was, why do I have to have nurses or doctors do this one particular thing when a computer can do it? So I disintermediated, the, we had like 150 doctors at this time, I disintermediated about half of my doctors and said, our software can do the same thing that you guys are doing and we just need you at the tail end to make sure our software did a good job. And that's alchemy. That's turning an idea from lead into gold. And, oh, did I get a lot of pushback on that? Man, did I get a lot of pushback on that? So there's three <laughs> simple steps that I kind of came up with that allowed me to really grow SID um, from zero to where it was, you know, a fully functional company. Well, what are those three steps then? I mean, that's a simple question. Yeah, it's a simple question. And <laughs> I've got a, a simple answer that's not easy. So it's um, 
they're really easy looking uh, looking in the rearview mirror. So, and I'll give you these examples. Um, and it's more complicated. Well, it's it's more difficult to do it a priori to do it in advance. But all entrepreneurs, every single entrepreneur, every single success you've ever heard of, has gone through these three steps, whether they know it or not. And I'm going to tell you what they are. So the first step is destroy something. Take an old rule or an old idea and take a flamethrower to it. So Amazon took a flamethrower to the idea that you have to go to a bookstore to buy books. When uh, Bezos was starting, right? And so it's real easy to see this in you know, in our rear view mirror. We go, oh yeah, I get it. I know, what, I know what Microsoft did. And then you go, how do I apply that to my business? What idea, what behavior am I going to destroy? Intel destroyed the idea that big computers have to, you know, that you can't have a computer sitting on your desk. Apple destroyed the idea that computers are hard and difficult to use and they're going to apply beautiful graphics to it, right? So I'm kind of staying in the IT space. Uh, if you think about, you know, Costco and Home Depot and the big box stores, they destroyed the idea that you have to have, you know, a expert come and, you know, do your decking or do your, your house, right? So what idea am I going to destroy? And this is not just me saying these things. The... This is all based on fundamental management theory. So there's a Harvard Business School professor named Clayton Christensen, who unfortunately passed away, but he wrote a book called The Innovator's Dilemma and The Innovator's Solution. Everybody listening to this podcast, go and read that damn book. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm talking about my book, but this is all based on management, real management um, basic theory, right? So destroy something. The idea in our business was that we were going to destroy the fact that you had to have an expert to do these things that our software could do. And man, did the experts get pissed off at that. But in the end, that's really what happened. What we ended up with was doctors who said, wow, your computers are doing a better job at the mundane tasks. We weren't taking away their, their medical knowledge. We were doing just, we were automating mundane tasks. But they wanted to be able to do that. So when you destroy something as an entrepreneur, you destroy an old idea, you're going to get a ton of pushback. Think about the pushback Amazon got when they first came out on this weird little thing called the internet, and they're going to sell you books. You're never going to beat Barnes & Noble. You're never going to... Well, we know how that turned out, right? Yeah. So that's step one. And I'm going, to, I'm going to go real high level on these. And you asked me if you want me to do a deep dive on any of these, and I, we can go really deep into it. No, that's fine. I am curious about one thing, though. So yes, what if you've got somebody who's in a business and they don't feel they're destroying something? So they're, they're, they've got a profitable business. Mm -hmm. Like, let's take one of my IT MS, managed service provider guys. Mm -hmm. um, and then the IT services are becoming, you know, kind of a commodity. Yeah. Okay. So they're providing those services, profitable business. Maybe they got some growth, but they're really not destroying something. Are you saying that they should be looking at taking it to a different level by looking for something to destroy? 100%. I know you're, uh, the guys who've got that profitable business and are making money are not going to like hearing what I'm about to say. You're going out of business. You're going to get disintermediated. You said it yourself. It's becoming a commodity business. The internet is commoditizing everything. So if you don't have brand or you don't have creative destruction, you might last a couple of years, you might last five years, but either you're going to get bought up by somebody at a low multiple because you're not doing anything interesting, or you're going to go out of business because someone's going to commoditize your, your idea and they're going to do it at one-tenth the price uh, or, or 10 times as quick, which is something that we looked at. Everything we did, if we couldn't do it at one-tenth the price or 10 times better or faster, we didn't do it. And then when we found something to destroy and we said, can we do it at one-tenth the price than our competitors? Can we do it at 10 times faster, better, faster, or cheaper? And we said, yes, we immediately went into that. And we took out competitors who thought they were safe. They weren't. And Great. I'll give, you, I'll give you a clear example on that. So... Um, I, I live by kind of a, there's a bunch of mottos that I live by. And one of them is, um, it's not the tyranny of the or, but it's the beauty of the and. And this is something that all entrepreneurs should have. This should be tattooed on your forehead. And this is what happened. Our competitors said, you guys can't do this thing that you do, this medical you know, analysis, faster and cheaper with the same quality. Because if you do it faster and cheaper, the quality has to go down because you're going to get worse people doing it. And we said, it's not quality or speed or money. It's quality and speed and money. And we're, how are we going to do that? We're going to automate the crap. Sorry about that. We're going to automate uh, um, the heck out of uh, the mundane tasks. And 
our competitors would have a, a kind of a, an appeal rate. They would make a decision you know, medically and about 20 to 25% of those decisions would get appealed by the doctor saying, hey, you made a bad decision. Our appeal rate went down to one-tenth of that, 2%. That's the 10%. And our competitors said, you can't do that. You can't do that. I said, we just did it for two years straight. Go talk to the customer. Go look at the reports. There are public reports. And guess what happened to that competitor? They eventually went out of business because we stole all their customers. If you are not destroying something, you will go out of business, start destroying something, and start doing it now. All right. I like it. Good <laughs> rally and cry. Yeah, what's number two? <laughs> and then it's hard to figure out what you're going to destroy. We can go into details on that. How the heck do I figure out what I'm going to destroy and stuff? We'll go into detail if you want. So number two is once you've destroyed something, you have to create something. So destruction is take an old rule that's no longer serving the customer or serving you. And then and in and, and alchemy, that's called negredo. It's called the blackening. And it's really kind of counterintuitive because you go, I'm going to build a business. And the first thing I have to do is think about destroying something. What is this crazy man talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and then the next one is called albedo, the whitening. Create something. Create a new rule. Simple one to take a look at as we use Amazon again. So Jeff Bezos destroyed the idea that you have to go to a bookstore to buy books. He created a rule that said, I can get you any book on the planet to your door in two days. And People were like, eh, no, it doesn't work. No, that's, that's a bunch of malarkey. Now he did it, right? So you have to create a rule that will supplement, that will replace the old rule that you destroyed. So here's one of the things that, you, you, that most entrepreneurs do. They go, we need creativity in our business. Let's go about and let's do a brainstorming session. By the way, type in, why does brainstorming not work on Google? And you'll see a ton of articles from very reputable firms, McKinsey, et cetera, telling you how brainstorming doesn't do anything. You end up with a <laughs> bunch of ideas that go nowhere. You end up working at a bank and saying, let's build airplanes. And the bank goes, we're not going to build airplanes, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's not this unfettered creativity. It's the crucible. It's taking the old idea, the lead that you're going to melt and turn into gold, and then starting to really focus on it and going, how do we replace this? So in my world, we, you know, we took the idea of, only doctors and experts can do this service. And we started to deconstruct it and go, computers can do all of the boring stuff that's not medically necessary. And we can replace people and they're not gonna like it. And that's good because we're doing something interesting if they don't like it. And it was hard because at the beginning we were copying our competitors and doing what they were doing. And of course we realized we're not gonna get anywhere. We're not as good as our competitors. Can't just do the same damn thing, right? We have to do something different. So we didn't say, we're going to sell, you know, honey and chocolate to our competitor. We said, we have to be very specific. The rule of Albedo, create something, has to replace. It has to be in service of the thing you destroyed. Nothing else. There's no wiggle room on that. And Amazon did exactly that, right? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It reminds me of a couple in a town I used to live in who built a business. They started in their house. They built a business called Tiny Cakes and they did little cupcakes. Yeah. So they didn't do the whole bakery thing. You know, you have to go to a bakery to get cupcakes or you right. have to go to the, the grocery store now has bakeries. But they did really high class, great tasting nice looking mini mm -hmm. cakes. Mm -hmm. And then they eventually got an office that even had a party room. So you could have a party and, and you know, it's not going to be your $45 million business like Sid management, mm -hmm. but for them, it was where they wanted to go, you know, to build this little business. Yeah. They had a band that was nicely painted that, you know, purple, they had tiny cakes, but it, they, they were kind of breaking the model in a small way to build a small business that met their needs and, and they enjoyed yeah. And, and I wouldn't necessarily, if they wanted to build a big business, I wouldn't take them out of the running because you said something that's important. I have to go to a bakery to buy, you know, really fancy cupcakes. No, you don't. You can go to a fancy cupcake store that will say, so there's, uh, I don't know if it's in where you live, but you've ever seen the business, nothing bunt cakes. Okay. It's, I'm, it's, I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a you know it's a it's a storefront and they're starting to franchise and they sell bunt cakes, little bunt cakes. That's it. And you're like, no one's gonna make a business out of it. <laughs> oh damn, you guys are making a business out of that and you're franchising it and you're growing it. And you know, it's interesting to start start to think about in your business, in your industry, what can I destroy? What mindset can I take a flamethrower to? 
And if you do it and your customers care about it, so you have to think about what are your customers doing? Well, they're looking, in this case, they're looking for sweets, right? You know, why are they doing it? Because maybe they have a party, right? And what would happen if they didn't do it? Well, they'd still go to a bakery. They wouldn't ignore, you know, that need. You go, great, I can disintermediate this. And this is uh, Joseph Schumpeter, who's, you know, an economist, kind of a traditional economist, talking about creative destruction. So this really does... It's hard to do. And we would sit in rooms. I would sit in rooms at Sid Management and we'd put up ideas on the wall and they'd be the stupidest ideas that you could ever imagine. But once in a while, that stupid idea would have a little thread to it. We go, well, let's pull on that piece. Let's see. Oh yeah, we can destroy the idea. And I'll give you a, a clear example that really worked for us uh, and got us to win business. So one of the things that if you're in the healthcare space, you've got a, it's a highly regulated space. You got to file a ton of reports. And our customers have to file reports with the government all the time. And we said, what if you don't have to do these reports anymore? Now that didn't come from like, you know, a stroke of genius. That was in a big room and we we're thinking about, okay, we have to file these reports and file those reports. We say, oh, what are our customers have to file? They have to file these hundred page reports every two weeks and you know, 500 page reports every month. And we said, stop filing reports. We'll do it for you. Not only will we do it for you, we will guarantee that if we make a mistake and here's the Lloyd's of London insurance policy, we pay the fines. And guess what we won from that? Business. Because our customers were like, wait, I, I can go home and, and watch the game and open a six pack and not fill out this report. Go, yeah, we got your back on it. And of course, our competitors like, you can't do that. We said, well, we're doing it every day. Look at the customers and can we have some more of your customers, right? It sounds easy up front. It's not. It's simple. It's not a complicated concept. But getting it right takes a lot of trial and error and you'll feel like you're gonna fail. I fail more often than I am successful. And I fail, uh, I'll give you a clear example. I had a t-shirt company before I had um, SID management. And some of the t-shirts that we had made came in and I thought they were the ugliest things on the planet. And I said, because the manufacturer had made a, uh, an error. And I said to my director of operations, send them back. No one's going to buy these. He goes, nah, because they're like pink. They're supposed to be purple. They're not the right size. He goes, no, nah, let's put them on you know, the website and see what happens. Of course, what happened? We sold out <laughs> of the things I thought was a mistake. I make mistakes all the time. I make them in SID management. I make them all the time. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. That's the only way you're going to get through this simple process, but it's not easy. you got to push through it. You're going to think you're going to destroy something and you go, eh, my customers couldn't care less whether that I destroyed that. All right. So, so we're going to destroy something. We're going to replace it with something else. It's something. Uh -huh. What's the third step? Scale something. So Rubedo in uh, alchemy parlance. So alchemy has its own language, which is, you know, it's kind of fun. It's like kind of D&D-ish, right? And, <laughs> um, and, you know, if you look at alchemy, it gets weird uh, quickly, right? Because uh, no one's really turning lead into gold. But I don't know, let's talk to Bezos. He's turning an idea into gold. That's pretty impressive, right? Yeah. Uh, or Gates or any of our, you know, kind of our business heroes. Um, so they're Normal alchemy has like 12 different steps. I boiled it down to three. So destroy something, destroy an old idea, create something, create a new idea. And then the third one, Rubedo, scale something, breathe life into it. The first two are kind of, they're kind of mental exercises. The third one is how do I scale this? How will I grow this? How will I actually breathe life into it and actually put it on the ground? What systems will am I gonna have to build that will allow me to support this? What ego am I going to have to get out of my own way, like me saying, you know, this is the right thing or this is the wrong thing, to scale this? How do I actually breathe life into this? So those are the three steps. Everything, and again, I'm going to say, if, you know, everything that you've ever heard that's a success from Broadway shows like Hamilton to tech like Amazon to, you know, Nike shoes have gone these three steps. Wow. So where's the biggest problem do you think is it in deciding what to destroy or figuring out how you're going to replace it or is it in the scale thing because obviously at SID management you did a great job scaling but it couldn't have been easy right yeah um I think the answer is all they're all tough um you know like I said in hindsight in the rearview mirror we everybody goes oh of course they did that um the scaling part is complicated for a couple of reasons. One, if you're an entrepreneur, you tend to believe that you're the founder and you're the end-all be-all. And when I was creating SID, one of our primary motivations um, was to replace everybody, especially me. 
if it was all about me and building a, a, a company that had my personality on it and I had to go do the sales meetings and I had, you're not going to scale. So I listened to, so I use stoicism as a foundation for kind of my life and how I, uh, how I live. And one of the precepts, so like if your listeners ever want to hear anything, there's a dailystoic.com. You can get their newsletter. It's great. It, it really does talk about entrepreneurship, but also life in general. And one of them is ego is the enemy. So I think I have to go out and sell everything. That's me working in my business. When we hired our, my first VP of sales, he came in, he's like, I'm ready to go out and sell. And I go, great, you're not going to sell for about a year. And he was like, what are you talking about? You're spending all this money to hire a VP of sales. I said, we're going to build a sales system that we can drop sales guys into that we believe work. And then they're going to go out and scale this because then I can hire as many salespeople as I need to. And for example, one of the things we did, um, and I, I use, uh, like I said, I use kind of language to run the company. I had kind of these 35 sayings to help run the company. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the pieces of language that I use is um, don't get attached to outcome. So one of the very first thing I did with my sales guys was I let go of outcome, which is you have no quotas. You don't have to sell a million dollars a year. You get commissions, so you share in the sale. But if you were going to sell a million dollars a year or $10 million a year, you'd already be doing it because you want those commissions. So there's no quotas. My sales guys and my VP of sales essentially thought I was insane <laughs> and said, uh, you're crazy. Everybody's got quotas. People won't work without quotas. I said, but you can't lose 10 pounds. You can't make a million dollars. You can't attach to outcome. You can go to the gym every day. You can feed yourself good food. And at the end of a month, you'll lose 10 pounds. You can talk to your customers in the way they need to hear it. We can offer them good solutions. And at the end of the year, they will give us a million dollars in orders. And that's how we scaled it by, again, we, I, you know, Synaptic Alchemy is not just on the product side, it's on every core piece of your business, including sales. Destroy, burn to the ground, no quotas for our sales guys. Well, burn to the ground. Go ahead. It's interesting what you're saying because it sounds consistent with what James Clear of Atomic Habits says, where he says, really, it's the habits you need to focus on because yep. they create the outcomes. So yep. that leads me to the question, when you abolish the quotas, which I mm -hmm. haven't heard before, by the way, okay. <laughs> so, you know, very interesting, very intriguing. And I do have a biz dev background, so very intriguing. Um, did you then focus on what the habits were or 100%. what the processes were? So you focused on the activities yeah. and let the, the outcomes take care of themselves. Yep. Because if they, if they want, if we focus on the activity, I mean, on the outcomes, I'd be like, go sell a hundred million dollars. And people would be like, I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> That's right. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so for example, for us, one of the habits was we're in a regulated industry. And one of the first things that our sales guys did was they just went and tried to sell software to a uh, chief technical officer or a CIO. Right. Yeah. Um, and the very first thing we said is one of our activities is you don't talk to the technical guys at the beginning. You just don't, but that's how you sell software. Yeah, I know that's not how we're going to sell software because it, you know, we'd have to be Oracle to be able to do that. We're going to talk to the managers, the guys yeah. whose problem the software is going to solve. So part of our activity in our sales process, when our sales team would come in and we would do weekly sales meetings, the very first thing I would ask is, who are you talking to in what department? Did you talk to the product guys? Yeah. I don't even want to know if you talked to the tech guys yet. I don't want to hear about it. Did you talk to the managers? Yes. And here's the questions you need to ask. And here's the questions you need to answer. And we had a very formalized process, like going to the gym and saying, you're going to push weights. You're going to, you're going to do a bench press 10 times. You're going to ask these questions. And if you don't ask these questions and get answers to these questions, we're not going to win the deal. One of them was, and they hated doing this, but it was real important for us. Have you talked to legal yet? Have you asked legal, because it's a regulated industry, how our idea is going to break the customer? No, go ask them that. And then there's a bunch of very specific questions in that, right? Yeah, and yeah. our TL sales guys had to come back. And there was probably a hundred questions that they had to get answers to before we knew we had about an 80 to 90% chance of winning that customer. And they would come in and they would go, oh, the customer's taking me out to lunch. We're going to win. I go, no, you're not. You're going to go to lunch. <laughs> you got to answer these hundred questions before you win a deal. And if you do win, it's by accident. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. So well, the habits are vital because the habits are what leads to the outcomes. 
if you could get the outcomes, we'd all go and we'd all lose 10 pounds. We'd all go make a million dollars. We just press the habit. I mean, we should press the outcome button all day long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My, my wife up here in the Sacramento area is in Roseville is a superstar real estate agent. And so she developed a point system a few years ago and that really works for her. Yeah. So, so she just launched, she keeps up with her points. She knows that, you know, the business just flows. And yeah. so that's what she does. She doesn't focus on a number. Yep. Yeah. X yeah. number of points equals X number of dollars at the end of the day, right? So yeah, I think basically. lots of entrepreneurs don't build those systems. So I'm a big systems guy, right? They don't build those systems in place, which is all about scaling to go, here are the habits we're going to follow that will lead to the outcome. And the problem is, is that it's scary because you go, I'm going to the gym every day. I'm talking to my customers every day, but I, at the end of this week, no one bought. You go, yeah, that's okay. So it has to come from, as a founder, part of the culture you're going to imbue, this is where it's not cult personality, but it is the culture we're going to imbue is the habits matter, the outcomes don't, the outcomes will follow the habits. Yeah. And it, I think it's important to point out for those that didn't catch it, and I hope everybody did, but that you really had a very specific process that had to be followed mm -hmm. that you knew gave you the maximum potential to yep. win the sale um, if it was followed. Yep. It's not just, uh, okay, make 100 calls. No, <laughs> no, that's not a process. No, <laughs> no, that's not a process. So I think a lot of people get lost with that. It's like how many calls they need to make, how many, whatever. Yeah. Particularly when I think of this IT uh, services business, you know, they go out and provide a valuable service, but yeah. as there have become more and more people providing it, it's more and more of a commodity. Yep. Yeah. And there's not a lot of people, there are some who are trying to think of what you're saying, although they haven't put it this way you know, what can we break or where are we still not meeting the customer's need? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, or how can we make the response faster? Right. Now you got a problem with your computer. It's great. I got an MSP, but if I'm going to hear back from them in four hours, mm -hmm. that's not necessarily a good thing. Yeah. If I can't do something, you know, but if I can get an answer in two minutes, that's right. One tenth the time. If I get four minutes, four hours versus four minutes, and they're priced the same, where's all the business going to run to? Yeah. Four yeah. minutes, and they're going to get commoditized. They're going to go out of business because they're not thinking. It's hard to think about how do you destroy yourself, right? So when we went from yeah. product A to product B uh, in in SID management, one of the things was we were going to lose about. 30% of our, of our revenue, the customers were going to stay, but we were going to cut prices and we we're going to suddenly lose 30% of our revenue the day we launched the next product with software because we were doing more stuff and we're like, drop the price. Amazon does this amazing. If you're, if you're uh, into AWS or anything, you'll constantly see Amazon constantly dropping the price on themselves, cannibalizing themselves. If you can't look in the mirror and go, how do I eat my left arm, right? How do I go from four hour response time to a four minute response time? And we're going to do this team period. Someone else will. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Cause, cause I mean, that's where it really comes down to. And then the other thing I talked to them about is, well, do you have a, a specialty in certain industries? Mm -hmm. So when you go into like law offices, you know, the, the business, you know, the process flow and where it bottlenecks. And so you can speak to that specifically. And some of them do that. Well, a lot right. of them don't, a lot of them and do then, it only and a little bit. And they'll, sur and they'll survive, right? So I think what you said is really important. Um, and so, like I said, we had these 35 um, sound bites that ran SID, right? And I could, I could run SID from you know, the Himalayas if I wanted to, because the team had these sound bites that really worked. And one of them was, which is exactly what you just said, it's not about you. It's never been about you. It's never going to be about you. It's about your spouse, your husband, your wife, your kids, or your customers. If you don't know your customer's business better than they do, somebody else will come in and will, with the same product, win that customer, right? And yeah. most entrepreneurs feel, you know, we talk about our companies. We talk about how I want my customer to do this, how I want to win the sale. The reality, and boy, did my team hate it. No one cares about you. They <laughs> care about the customer, right? You got to get out of your ego. And so, what you just said was, if you're going into law firms as an MSP, you better understand how those law firms work better than the attorneys do. Because once you do, they look at you as an expert who happens to be selling this thing called software. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, so if we do hit a recession at some point, which we will, 
mm -hmm. you know, or worse, then um, they're not going to cut you off. It's like I have to keep him because yep. or her yep. because they're a business consultant for me. Yeah, and they're going to come to you and say, hey, this recession hit. We have to cut headcount. We have to cut yep. costs. Yep. What are your recommendations? Yeah. Right. And you'll be able to say, oh, this process, this thing, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Or here's thing. some new software you can use to help you do, you know, the following thing better, faster and cheaper. Right. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And even if you take it to like Starbucks, which, you know, some yeah. people hate Starbucks, some people love Starbucks, but you take a Starbucks, the people that love Starbucks, when there's hard times, because of the environment Starbucks tries to build, they don't always achieve it. If you drive around and you try different ones, there's a consistency there yeah. that makes people feel like they're at home or it makes them feel a little bit better, a little reassured, not only from the caffeine, but because the experience is the same, they can weather economic challenges and ups and downs and different things a lot easier than a company that you know, is very erratic in their customer experience. Yep. So, so you said some, you said you know, a bunch of things that were really interesting there. One of them is <clears throat> brand matters. So, you know, and becoming a business consultant or an expert in your field, including the field of coffee, you know, like you said, some people love it, some people hate it, but that consistency builds brand and brand, I think is one of the only things that's going to win in the age of the internet. Most everything's going to get commoditized. So I'm going to go buy from my brand right? Because coffee is coffee is coffee, right? You know, and some people will, you know, kind of split it, split out to Pete's or, you know, uh, other places, but Starbucks has brand. And what was interesting is as I was building Sid, <coughs> we became known because of Rubedo, that third piece of that scale piece. How do you scale? We decided this is the best way to do this one process. And we looked at a hundred different ways to do it. And we had brought my team in and we would diagram out all these different ways that the customer has to send a fax to a, a, um, a doctor. And then the doctor has to approve this. And then the regulars have to approve that. We would literally write out these processes and we would say, that's an old antiquated process. We're going to break it and we're going to create a new process. And our brand became, these are the, guys, these are the smart guys who understand the way this thing works but they don't customize. And that was really hard because we would have customers who would come in and say, wow, we wanna buy your stuff, but we need you to do something just a little bit to the left. And we said, great, we don't do that. We're not the guys for you, right? You need a custom solution, go find somebody else. We're scaling, we're doing this to, you know, not one a day, 10 a day, you know, we're doing a million or 10 million a day. The only way to do that is with this third step rebate was to build systems around scale and to, build your brand. And our brand became the smart guys who know what they're doing, but they don't budge from what they're doing. And that was hard. That, that hit my ego. I'm like, but I want to win a customer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah a customer totally. Say go away. <laughs> so when people pick up your book, Synoptic mm -hmm. Alchemy, mm -hmm. um, what, what's going to change in them when they get to the end of the book? So there's two sections to it. And I think you, you hit on both of the sections. The first section, and you can skip it if you want, is called Know Thyself. It's going to teach you how to know who you are, which means how to know who your company is. Like I just said, it's brand, right? I, I hope they don't skip that section. <laughs> <laughs> it's a harder section because you got to look at the mirror and it's, it, it uses Jungian psychology and it, you get taught uh, how to understand who you, what your personality is. And for example, I'll give you a real clear example. I took, um, so there's a thing called the big five personality profile test. It's like all the te personality tests are out there, DISC and Myers-Briggs, et cetera. Um, and one of the pieces on it tells you how agreeable you are. And even though I've been told many times I'm the most collaborative executive people have met, I'm not that agreeable. I'm kind of hard edged. <laughs> Once I've decided this is the best way to do something, I don't move very often unless a lot of evidence just really sways my, my point of view. But I've usually done a lot of research to, to get there. And it really hurt because I was like, no, I'm agreeable. I promise. <laughs> so know thyself will get you to know who you are, which also means you'll know who your business is. And that will build brand, which builds, uh, you know, excess profits and builds safety. The second half of the book is called the alchemical transformation. It's those three steps in details. Destroy something, create something, scale something with all the detail behind. How do I do that? Right. <clears throat> And that's turning an idea from lead into gold. So there are two very distinct pieces of the book and they, they follow this kind of fun Dungeons and Dragons alchemy spirit, right? So know thyself has, 
uh, what's called prima materia, the primary piece of who you are, and the philosopher's stone, how do you express yourself? And then there's the alchemy piece. So they're gonna get, who am I? Who is my business? How do I drive brand? And then how do I turn some crazy idea I have into the gold of new customers? Fabulous, fabulous. Well, they can get the book um, on Amazon, everywhere books are sold. Oh. And uh, if they want to learn more about you and what you're doing, where do they go? Uh, you can see meet me on LinkedIn. Just type in my name personally, Stephen Cardinelli. You can go to www.synapticalchemy.com. You'll see me there. I do tweet once in a while. I should be better at it. You can go to Facebook slash Synaptic Alchemy. You can kind of find me anywhere. If you type in either Synaptic Alchemy or my name, you'll find me. The other thing I would like to offer your listeners is if they buy the book and they send the receipt to pod at synapticalchemy.com, just email it. They'll get a, um, a coupon. I'll be creating a course hopefully by the end of June. Uh, the course will sell normally for 195 bucks. They'll get it for free. Oh, cool. Well, that's great. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. This has been great. I, I love what you're saying. A lot of leaders need to follow this path. No, oh, great. I appreciate it. Super fun to talk to you. Thanks for tuning in today. If you like the episode with Stephen, please subscribe, leave us a comment or a rating. We always like to hear from you. And come back next week. Another great show planned. 